Where do you think is the most important place for us to start this conversation, based on everything you know? And maybe some of the, presumably there's some like foundational stuff, right? I do. I think the important place to start would be, we're talking about, we were talking about aging as a disease. And I think being sedentary is a disease. And I think that's a good place to start. What I mean by being sedentary is not physically active. Someone who doesn't engage in any type of physical activity. And what is the spectrum there of, you know, someone who doesn't move at all for, you know, 24 hours a day versus, or you've got obviously someone that's constantly running marathons and doing crazy stuff. But where, is, where are most of us on that scale? And are we moving enough? Most of us are not moving on that enough. And most of us are, if you're talking about globally, we're on that sedentary scale where we're just not physically active. We sit at our computer or our desk or our cubicle, you know, all day, and we're not, we're not actually moving around a lot. Um, and I say, I say sedentary-ism is a disease because it's actually been shown to increase the risk of early mortality even more than diseases that we know of, like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or even terrible habits like smoking. So being sedentary actually could predict early mortality even more than those diseases. But it, 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 let's take a step back. It's even bigger than that. There, there's this amazing study. It's called the Dallas Bed Rest Study. And the study started back in the 1960s. And this is done by probably the world's most talented cardiovascular exercise physiologist. And so Ben Saltine, uh, Jerry Mitchell were involved in this early study in the 1960s. And what they did was they took five men, they were college students, and they put them on bed rest. And this is like three weeks of legitimate bed rest. We're talking, they couldn't get up to go to the bathroom. So they had a catheter in them. They did not move for three weeks. The researchers wanted to find out what happens to your cardiovascular system if you are not moving around for three weeks. And now if you think about it, you know, there's a lot of people that are undergoing surgery or they have some sort of bad illness, influenza or something that keeps them bedridden for, it's not unusual to be three weeks, to be mm -hmm. honest. So it's not completely irrelevant. And what was found is after that three weeks, you know, their cardiovascular system was just tanked. And one of the major, they, they were probably the, some of the most well-studied men at the time. And um, one of the biggest factors that was measured was their cardiorespiratory fitness. This is often called VO2 max. And essentially, it's the maximum amount of oxygen that you can breathe in in your lungs, then breathe that oxygen to your muscles. And it's measured during maximal exercise. You're putting in a maximal effort. And that's called your cardiorespiratory fitness. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But their cardiorespiratory fitness tank. And now... I mentioned this was in the 1960s. About 30 years later, and this is where uh, Ben Levine came into the study. He's at the UT Southwestern in Dallas. He's also very uh, one of the most famous you know, cardiovascular exercise physiologists out there right now. They found these five men from 30 years earlier, and they measured their cardiorespiratory fitness and a variety of other parameters that they had measured at the time. And what they found was that three weeks of bed rest was worse on their cardiorespiratory fitness than 30 years of aging. So essentially, their cardiorespiratory fitness was no worse 30 years later than it was after their three weeks of bed rest, which is kind of amazing because you would think that the 30 years of aging would be worse on your cardiorespiratory fitness than the three weeks of bed rest. And it's the same, the same individuals. The same individuals, the same five men. Um, now, after the three weeks of bed rest, you know, back, back in the 1960s, they were able to get their cardiorespiratory fitness back up again once they started exercising and moving around, and it took a while. But when you look at their baseline levels, their baseline cardiorespiratory fitness, and you compare it to their cardiorespiratory fitness baseline 30 years later, it wasn't worse than what happened when they they compared it to the three weeks of bed rest. And you might go, well, why is that so significant, the cardiorespiratory fitness dropping? We know that cardiorespiratory fitness is one of the best predictors of longevity. So there are studies that have shown that people with a high cardiorespiratory fitness live five years longer than people with a low cardiorespiratory fitness. That's, you know, 
pretty big difference. They're, they're basically 80% less likely to die of many different causes of, of death, so cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory disease, things like that, than people with a low cardiorespiratory fitness. So you're really getting you know, a five-year increased life expectancy. You're sort of pushing and delaying those age-related diseases like cardiovascular disease, you know, like cancer, for example. You're pushing them down later in life. So you're not, you're not dying from them sooner. And we do know that really just going, getting anywhere out of that low cardiorespiratory fitness. So people with the low cardiorespiratory fitness are people that are sedentary. And if you just move anywhere above that, even if you're going low from low bad to like low normal, you're gaining about two years increase in life expectancy. And that's not really that hard to do. But if you think about cardiorespiratory fitness, like right here, just having this conversation, actually even just sitting quietly, it takes about three milliliters of oxygen per minute per kilogram body weight to do that. To carry groceries to your car, it takes about 11 milliliters of oxygen per minute per body weight, per kilogram body weight. Mm -hmm. And so as you're aging, you're kind of heading towards this cliff, right? Because your cardiorespiratory fitness goes down with age. It does. That's what happens naturally. If you're at the point where you don't work on your cardiorespiratory fitness, if you're not being physically active, and there are certain exercises that are better at improving cardiorespiratory fitness than other, others, if you're not trying to improve it, you're going to be heading towards that cliff faster. And then everything becomes a maximal effort. You're out of breath just talking. You're out of breath carrying groceries to your car. Everything is a maximal effort. And you don't want to be there. You don't, that, that quality of life is not good. It's not good, right? And then on top of that, you're also going to die sooner. So you're talking about two things here. You're talking about decreased health span and decreased lifespan. So yeah, we should be moving more. Right. And the question is, well, how do you improve your cardiorespiratory fitness, right? Yeah. I mean, do you lift weights? Do you go for runs? Do you bike? What is it that is really good at improving cardiorespiratory fitness? And that's the question that a lot of exercise physiologists have answered over the last couple of decades. You want to do and engage in what's called vigorous intensity exercise. So this is the kind of exercise where you're not able to have a conversation when you're engaged in it, right? So, so your heart rate is going up to about 80% your max heart rate. You're not able to really talk. And it's, I would say, you know, it's something that can be done in intervals. So you can do high intensity interval training. So you have these intervals where you're getting your heart rate up, you're doing vigorous exercise, and then you have recovery periods where you're kind of resting, you're, you're lowering your heart rate, you're not doing that, max, that maximal sort of exercise. 